Good evening, everyone. Welcome and thank you for joining us for our second discussion on COVID-19. I'm Jennifer Schaefer, the Assistant Vice President for Development at the University of Toledo College of Medicine and Life Sciences. For today's presentation, please submit your questions for Dr. Cooper and our presenters using the chat feature. We will answer all questions after Dr. Smith speaks as some questions may be answered along the way. Now, I would like to turn things over to our moderator for today's conversation, Dr. Christopher Cooper. Dr. Cooper earned his medical degree from the University of Cincinnati, where he graduated as class valedictorian. He completed his cardiology residency and fellowship programs at the Brigham and Women's Hospital in Boston, which is associated with the Harvard College of Medicine. Dr. Cooper has been a part of the University of Toledo for more than 25 years. Excuse me. In the field of cardiology, he is known across the globe and has received more than $25 million in external funding for his research initiatives. His work has been published in numerous journals, such as the New England Journal of Medicine, and I will now turn it over to Dr. Cooper. Hi, everybody, and Jennifer, thank you so much for the kind introduction. Um, hello. To those of you who are participating tonight, I am Dr. Christopher Cooper, Dean of the College of Medicine and Life Sciences and Executive Vice President for Clinical Affairs at the University of Toledo. As a word of introduction, our College of Medicine is in the business of discovery through nationally recognized research, some of which you'll hear about tonight, uh, patient care, and training many of our region's physicians, scientists, and other healthcare professionals. The compass that guides us is our mission, which is to improve the health in our community and in our region. To that end, there's a tremendous need in our community for reliable and accurate information about COVID-19. This evening, I'm really excited to share with you a national a panel of nationally recognized leaders that include virologists that actually work with the COVID-19 virus and other potentially lethal viruses infectious disease specialists who are on the front lines of COVID care and who also lead many of our region's responses and who are nationally recognized for their work. And we have a pharmacist who's leading UTMC's efforts to distribute the vaccine and the chair tonight, the chair of the Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology. Our goal for tonight is to get solid, reliable information out to our community that you can trust. I would like to take a moment to introduce our presenters and panelists. Dr. Saurabh Chattopadhyay is a virologist and assistant professor in the Department of Medical Microbiology and Immunology. He graduated from the Indy Institute of Technology in Delhi and did a postdoc at the Cleveland Clinic. He has published over 51 peer reviewed publications and has over a million dollars in funding for his research from the National Institutes of Health. We also have with us tonight Dr. Joan Duggan, who's an infectious disease specialist and a professor in um, internal medicine, as well as a senior associate dean for faculty affairs and development. She earned her degree here in town from the Medical College of Ohio, our predecessor, and completed an infectious disease fellowship at the University of Michigan. She's had numerous awards, millions of dollars in research funding, and over 130 publications. We also have Dr. Jennifer Hanrahan, an infectious disease specialist and the chief of the Division of Infectious Disease here at the university. She earned her medical degree from the Chicago College of Osteopathic Medicine and completed a fellowship at University Hospitals in Cleveland. She's written prolifically and is passionate about education and the mentoring of students, residents, and fellows, and is an invited speaker locally and nationally on COVID in the clinical setting. Dr. Jason Huntley is an associate professor in the Department of Medical Microbiology and Immunology. He is also director of our biocontainment facility that studies the live COVID-19 virus and other potentially lethal infectious agents. He earned his doctoral degree from Iowa State and was a National Institutes of Health Infectious Disease Fellow. Dr. Huntley has published prolifically, has given over 50 invited presentations at national and international conferences and has had more than 4 million in federal research. Interestingly, in January of this past year or a year ago, 
Dr. Huntley introduced Dr. Anthony Fauci at the National BioThreats Conference in Washington, D.C. Dr. Fauci, as you know, opened the nation's eyes to a novel and deadly viral pneumonia that was at that time sweeping through China, what we now know as COVID-19. Um, we have with us tonight Dr. Russell Smith, who's the Chief Pharmacy Officer, Quality and Safety Officer, and an Administrator for UTMC. Um, Russ has more than 25 years of academic pharmacy experience. He oversees all clinical pharmacy activities on all university campuses. He earned his bachelor's degree here at the University of Toledo and a doctor of pharmacy at the University of Shenandoah. Russ is leading the university's COVID immunization program. Dr. Travis Taylor is a, also a virologist and an assistant professor in our Department of Medical Microbiology and Immunology. He got his doctoral degree from UT Southwestern and did postdoctoral training at the Na National Institutes of Health Rocky Mountain Labs. Um, he also has a number of publications and several million in grant funding from the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases, the agency that Dr. Fauci runs for the federal government. Finally, it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Jim or James Van Hook, who is the Rita T. Sheely Endowed Chair in Obstetrics and Gynecology at the University of Toledo's College of Medicine and Life Sciences. Dr. Van Hook earned his medical degree at Louisiana State and, his resident, and did his residency in OBGYN at the University of Texas. Dr. Uh, uh, Van Hook is the exemplary lifelong learner who has completed fellowships in critical care, maternal fetal medicine, and addiction medicine. He has received over a million dollars in external funding, has been invited to present his work at a, over 120 venues, and has written more than 140 publications. At this time, it's now my pleasure to turn it over to Drs. Duggan and Hanrahan, who are going to answer some of the questions that you posed to us recently. Thanks. Well, I'm Dr. Joan Duggan, and along with Dr. Hanrahan, our Chief of Infectious Diseases, we're going to get started on four of the questions we had from the last town call, specifically herd immunity, vaccine side effects, infectivity, and the social determinants of health. So we're going to have a slide set set presentation for these questions. I'll present, Dr. Hanrahan's gonna uh, uh, tie it together at the end, and then we're also available at the end of the town hall for questions. So first, the question we got, immunity, herd and otherwise, question. With 60 to 72% of the population being resistant, required for herd immunity, what is the ballpark estimate for when you see the U.S. reaching herd immunity? And also please discuss how long we would need mass social distancing and the need for flu vaccination and vaccine resistance. Next slide. Okay, so what's herd immunity? So during the course of natural infection or vaccination, it's when you get enough people to become an immune to a disease to make spread unlikely, even among those who are still susceptible. You, when you hit that point, you hit herd immunity. Next slide. So herd immunity for COVID is pictured on the left-hand side with susceptible people being the blue, people who are vaccinated being kind of the green protectors and people who are contagious being red. But if you take a look over at the, the right slide, this is really where the concept comes from. You've got a crouching lion and you've got the herd, different variants of the herd, and then two little susceptible little, little um, elk there um, that, are, that need to be protected. They're, that's what herd immunity is about, protecting susceptible individuals. Next slide. So how much herd immunity do you need? Actually depends on a whole bunch of factors, like how contagious a pathogen is uh, in and around the herd, how much immunity you get from prior infection through vaccination, contagiousness of a pathogen, that, that famous R not expression, and also your expected contact with the pathogen. Now, usually they quote in public health rates of 50 to 90% immunity within a population expected to afford herd immunity. But that depends on the pathogen. So let's take a real quick look at measles and herd immunity. Next slide. So measles is spread by aerosols. It's highly infectious. It's R not. It's reproduction number. How many people you expect to infect is like 12 to 18. By contrast, COVID's about two. Um, and based on a number of studies, we think that it, about 95% of the population, 90-95, needs to be immune to have effective herd immunity because of that high R not number, okay? So when we look at herd immunity for things like COVID, we're really trying to extrapolate from a whole bunch of studies 
based on what we know about infectivity from measles and the protection needed, and influenza and chickenpox and smallpox and mumps and a whole bunch of other things. Next slide. So estimates of herd immunity that are needed to stop infectivity and the spread of COVID to susceptible individuals, we're not talking about eliminating spread completely or eradicating it off the face of the earth like, like smallpox, they range from about 60 to 85%. The World Health Organization is still citing the 60 to 75%. But as new data emerge, you know, these estimates can change and a whole bunch of different variables can weigh in. Um, but with, with, next slide. But with that in mind, we don't know when we're going to reach the level of protection that we need to take off our masks. There's a whole bunch of formulas out there for herd immunity. Um, we and you just need to know what those numbers are to actually plug them in the equation. And who knows when it'll all all be good? I'm I, I'll bet 25 cents third quarter of 2021. Um, but with that in mind, before we go on to the next question set on vaccine side effects, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Hanrahan. Um, for her thoughts on herd immunity and COVID. All right, so we're having a little bit of technical difficulty, so we're gonna go to the next slide, which is vaccine side effects. Okay, so there are lots of reports about the high incidence of side effects of the vaccine. Fevers, chills, fatigue, muscle joint pain, create and things like that. And they've been creating confusion and doubt about the safety of the vaccines. Can the panelists please provide comment on, Jennifer, are you on now? I'm on now. Okay, any questions, any, any last thoughts about herd immunity before we switch over to vaccine side effects? And when yeah. we get the masks off? So I just wanna say quickly, thank you for explaining herd immunity in a way that hopefully people can understand. I think that it's really important to keep in mind that we shouldn't, I don't think we should focus so much on what percentage of people do we need to get to, you know, until we've achieved this. I think it's going to, it may be a moving target. And what people should be focusing right on right now is that it's important to get the vaccine, try to get as many people vaccinated as we possibly can. Because really, until we get a lot of people vaccinated, we're, we're not changing anything that's going on right now. The more virus there is spreading in the community, the more opportunity there is for mutations to come up. And so the more that this is going to go on. So I would I would really focus on just trying to make sure that people are getting vaccinated. So the, the segue oh, oh back up a second. So the, the segue now about vaccine side effects, we need to have people vaccinated. People are now hearing about high incidence of side effects. Uh, so can the panelists please comment on how uh, these are expected side effects and they do not mean the vaccines are dangerous. Okay. So this is also, you know, back to the uptake is going to be important for getting us back to quote unquote normal. Next slide. So I want to talk for one second about risk benefit ratio, just to kind of bring this down to a, uh, a reasonable level for people. I want to tell you about a medication that some of you might have heard of that's actually associated potentially with liver failure at times resulting in trans liver transplant and death even occasionally at normal doses, allergic reactions in 5% of people, including anaphylaxis, nausea and vomiting in 10% of patients, and 500 overdose fatalities per year. What is this medication? Next slide, or next button. It's Tylenol, okay? So if you read the black box warning or the package insert for Tylenol, it's a scary concept. So we have to remember that when, we're, when, we're, when we talk to you about, about uh, side effects. Next slide. So basically, if you look on the FDA website, same place I got this, this other information, the reported side effects for Moderna, pain at the injection site, tiredness, headache, muscle pain, chills, joint pain, swollen, lymph nodes, the same as the physician, nausea, vomiting, fever. Wow. Um, that lasts several days and potentially increased incidence after the second dose. Same side effect profile for Pfizer and influenza and Tdap, whooping cough, Next slide. Because a lot of what you're actually seeing with the side effect profile of vaccines is actually some, somewhat a reflection of your immune system starting to work with cytokine release. And we're not going to get into that in any detail. But these are, again, some of the side effects that we see for vaccine are normal and happen with every vaccine. They're not scary. And nearly all vaccines list anaphylaxis as a reported side effect. So you'll see reports of one in a million incidents of anaphylaxis with the flu vaccine. 
And there's no evidence to date that the COVID vaccines are associated with any higher incidence of side effects than many others out that we have out there. But obviously, we need longer term data. Uh, Jennifer, any thoughts about vaccine side effects before we go into infectivity? Yeah, I think it's really important for people to know that these are, I would no longer consider these to be experimental vaccines, which is one of the reasons that people are scared to get them. As of yesterday, 5.3 million people in the United States have gotten these vaccines. That's a huge number of people. And we've heard of a handful of people who had allergic reactions, and those have been mild and resolved quickly. So, you know, there's no reason for people to think that there are worse side effects from this vaccine than from other vaccines or that these are dangerous. I think it's very important to note people know a lot of people have gotten these vaccines and are doing fine. And healthcare workers get these vaccines and go immediately back to work. And I don't know of anyone who's had to stay home from work from the vaccine. We've all gotten our vaccine and ID. So it's, it's you know, we, we can give firsthand testimony of no more side effects than uh, the influenza vaccine. So the next question, we could ask this one a lot in ID about contagiousness infectivity. So this, this question was, my son and daughter-in-law are sick with COVID after obsessively following every protocol. Are there ways of becoming infected that we're not aware of? Well, most of the studies show that really what happens is you actually pick up COVID from your spouse or a person living in your house, who, and there may have been a, a, a break in, um, tech, in, in um, infect, infection prevention going on. That's really the main way people get COVID. Um, but again, COVID transmission is incompletely understood. Uh, we know direct person-to-person -person spread occurs through respiratory droplets within six feet. Um, but you can also pick it up, you know, inadvertently, you pick up, you're cleaning up a child's used tissues, you accidentally unconsciously touch your eyes and nose. Lots of little breaks in technique can happen when you're trying to have really strict adherence to infection control. Next slide. And then, you know, you'll always read stories about, you know, different ways COVID spreads. You'll, you'll see stories about, oh, it can live on paper and plastic and steel for varying length of time. It's been recovered from stool and blood and ocular secretions and semen. But, you know, a lot of times we don't know if it's replication competent virus. So just because you 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 can detect PCR at a police site doesn't mean, you know, you, you've got a um, um, replication competent uh, person there. So multiple examples exist of the unusual mechanisms transmission. And you got to remember, this is a work in process. I'm going to just real quickly tell you about one of the more unusual ones, just not to not to worry people, but just to tell you that this is a really evolving topic. So this article came out. This is actually first reported months ago, but it finally came out in its full form um, in the Annals of Internal Medicine um, just in the last month. And it was a study done in a high-rise building in China where there were three families, total of nine people, who they couldn't figure out how they got COVID. And so somebody went into the, the apartment building, they released tracer gas into the bathrooms as kind of a surrogate for virus-laden aerosols in the drainage system. And if you look over here at the last pictures over on the, the side, you'll see they have somebody um, um, using a, a, a bathroom and aerosol flow that's coming back up into different um, um, apartments. And so there's always bizarre and interesting ways that pathogens spread. They're not common, but when people say, I can't figure out how I got something, you know, it's, it can be very hard to trace it back. Um, Dr. Hanrahan, any other thoughts about this? Yeah, I, the one thing I would want to say is that for almost everyone who's told me that they have no idea where something came from, there's usually a family member um, so even if you are super careful, if you live with someone who is not careful, then you're going to get exposed. So I, the bottom line is that almost everyone that I've taken care of who's had this, um, they've gone to grocery stores or restaurants or, you know, they've done things where they could have potentially been exposed. So if you interact with other people, um, if people come into your house that are not wearing masks, you're potentially going to be exposed. So the fewer people you interact with, the better while this is going on. So the next uh, set of slides are about healthcare disparities. And uh, does our, Jennifer, I think you're getting get feedback. So our, does our hyperimmune complex insurance system with unaffordable co-pays contribute to the spread of COVID. Next slide. 
So I'm going to point out really quickly three articles, uh, one from Annals of Internal Medicine, one from um, the CDC, and one from the Wall Street Journal, that point out how some disconnects in our delivery of health care may impact the pandemic. So the first one, the authors took a look at survey data and extrapolated it to healthcare workers. Next slide. So they, they, they estimated that there were thir almost 14 million healthcare workers nationwide, and over a quarter of them actually had significant risk factors for COVID, but the rates that they were covered by insurance varied dramatically. And, only, and while 3% of hospital workers were insured, national average is about 9%, Almost one in six, 15% of non-hospital healthcare workers, so people, people that work in a nursing home, home health aides, things like that, were uninsured, okay? And many times when people don't have uh, health insurance, they also work, may work in a situation where they don't have adequate sick time policies and time, times off, um, often leaving them with no alternative but to go into work while sick or go into work sometimes in, in areas where they might not have enough um, um, training or ability to avoid picking up COVID. Next slide. So looking at other social um, um, uh, disparities of health and COVID spread. So in the CDC publication, Morbidity and Mortality Weekly Report, MMWR, quote, during March to June, 2020, 11% of West Virginia nursing homes experienced a COVID outbreak. The one star lowest ratings were about, uh, had about a 95% higher outbreak rate than the five star ratings. Is that a surrogate marker for social determinants of health? In other words, you know, the nursing home you're in having the, the different star ratings? Next slide. Well, it might be, because if you actually go to the website and you take a look at nursing homes within a 25 mile radius of Charleston, West Virginia, if you try to find a five star nursing home that accepts Medicare and Medicaid, you'll find zero. And if you try to find a four star one, there are two, but I don't know what the waiting list is like. The vast majority of them are the one stars, the ones that, that, that have more spread of COVID. Next slide. So finally, last thing about, about social determinants of health and about the, just the way insurance works. This came from the Wall Street Journal last, last week. I don't know if anybody saw it or not, but it was about um, Regeneron and bam um, um the new monoclonal antibodies. And so the Wall Street Journal was, was, was criticizing the fact that um, there are doses, millions of these monoclonal antibodies authorized for emergency use that are sitting unused in hospital pharmacies, even as cases surge across the country. And these are ones that are injected intravenously and early trial data of therapies show that they could reduce hospitalizations or emergency visits among high-risk patients. Okay, so let's break this down. Next slide. So basically I've, I've gotten five calls in the last 24 hours about this, about you know where can I get this drug? You know, Regeneron, one of the, 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 the um, um, monoclonal antibody cocktails. So we're talking about an intravenous medication so it's got to be have an IV that's infused over 60 minutes. Where? In your doctor's office? After you call them up and tell them that you just tested positive for COVID, but you're feeling okay? That's specifically designed to be given to people who aren't in a hospital, not currently sick enough to go to the ER or the hospital, but they've tested positive for COVID and they may get sick. And it's been delivered to where? Drum roll hospitals during a pandemic when they're filled. What's wrong with this picture? What's wrong with this picture? This is my last comment before I turn it over to Dr. Van Hook, and then Dr. Hanrahan and I will be available at the end for questions as well. What's wrong with this picture is to fair, paraphrase D.H. Henderson, who was in charge of the World Health Organization in the 1960s to eradicate smallpox. Basically, it's not vaccines that save lives. Many have said this. It's not vaccines, it's vaccination programs. So yes, yeah, social disparities of health actually disconnect sometimes people from the provision of care and that complexities of insurance are part of that and that yes that may have a, pro a part of the spread of COVID. So with uh, no further ado I'm going to turn this over to um, our next speaker Dr. Jim Van Hook our chair of ob -GYN. Hello everybody thank you so much for letting me uh, be a part of this hopefully I can answer some questions. I tell you I'm going to, there were two main lines of questions that were asked, and I'm going to address those first, and I'm going to try to get in at the end a little bit, just kind of a, uh, about pregnancy itself. But I thought about making a lot of slides, but I thought, why don't I just pretend I'm talking to you like you're my patient? And 
because that's really where the communication sort of occurs. The first main sort of question, there was a couple of questions about what to do if we have a pregnant person that's cohabiting, annotating with, you know, other high, you know, patients like an elderly person or what have you. I think you need to think of pregnancy as a higher risk, you know, a, a higher risk patient and the same rules that you would normally want to try to do. In other words, keep your bubble small really is what you should what you should do if you're going to combine households that's not the answer we all want to hear and it feeds into our fears and fears are real uh, to us but that's really the issue now i will tell you the silver lining on on pregnant people it's a silver lining that we get if you want to pick a population of folks that are motivated for their health by and large it's pregnant individuals so in some way, the kind of secret weapon we have is that provided pre our pregnant patients, our women, pregnant women, are able to really understand what they need to do, a lot of them will do those things and maybe some degree more than some other people. So that's what one thing that's really kind of cool about it. The next main thing that people were kind of asking about is about is the vaccine okay? Can you give a pregnant person or a pregnant person who is lactating? Is it safe? Does it cause infertility? Does it cause birth defects? It's already been mentioned, but you're balancing risk to benefit with any treatment, just like the Tylenol. You wouldn't just want somebody to take Tylenol just to take Tylenol, right? Well, in pregnancy, we have to deal with those kind of situations all the time. The vaccine, the way it's made, the way it's structured, the type of vaccine it is, by what I would the fancy word would be biological plausibility. It is of the same type of vaccine that for other diseases is safe. It does not modify DNA. They have not found any of the issues that we thought that were brought up. Um, the, um, and consequently, since pregnant patients are at a higher risk cohort, in other words, they're a higher risk group of folks, they should qualify for vaccines just like anybody else should. The American College of OBGYN, and at the end, at the end I think when the information will be given, y'all will give you the link to the website. It's not very complicated. Uh, can actually get you the most recent position statement. They don't recommend people that become pregnant after having the first dose of the vaccine, uh, you know, not get the second dose. So this is a balanced risk to benefit, just like you make every day when you go in your car. And I make every day when I go in my car to go to work. I think it's better to ride to work in my car, but I'm taking a small risk. The last thing I'll say before we shift on the other part, generally speaking, pregnant patients, pregnant patients that have a lot of other things wrong with them and who get really severe, you know, severe disease, those people become management problems and they become more challenging to take care of. Pregnant patients tend to be somewhat younger. There's a group that have a lot of other things wrong with them, but relatively healthy patients, we generally manage those with mild to moderate disease, particularly mild disease, kind of like we manage anybody else, except for the fact that I get additional gray hairs sweating over it. Uh, and we keep track of the patients like we do with other diseases. So, um, Hopefully that'll answer some questions. I'll be in the the in you know the chat at the end of this. I'm really grateful to be here. And uh, Dr. Huntley is about to talk here now, and I learned a whole lot of stuff when I watched his slides before. So I'm sure you will too. Well, thanks, Dr. Van Hook. Uh, thank you everybody for joining tonight. Next slide, please. So I'm going to use my time to answer some questions that came up not only tonight but in the previous session and when you registered. We had questions about. Again, how are the vaccines different? There's two approved vaccines in the U.S. Are they safe? And is one preferred? So you've heard about the Pfizer and Moderna vaccines. They both are given in two doses. They both are messenger RNA. Again, your cells are made up of DNA. Messenger RNA is different. If you think of DNA as the blueprint of your cells, messenger RNA is more like the task list for just today. So that can when it's introduced as a vaccine, it cannot cause mutations, it cannot cause but Over 30 years of research, it has no adverse effects. You also have heard about how it has to be shipped on dry ice. So it's very unstable. 
It will produce the spike protein and teach your immune system how to fight off COVID adverse effects. Both vaccines are given 21 days, sorry, Pfizer is given 21 days apart. Moderna is given 28 days apart. That's the difference. But both vaccines are 94 to 95% effective. Uh, Fred in the chat asked, how do we know that? They were given to 30 to 40,000 uh, volunteers in clinical trials. They were randomly assigned either the vaccine or a placebo. And then those um, volunteers, the COVID infection rate was assessed in those. So again, over 30 or 40,000 volunteers in two different vaccine trials, that's how they came up with the effectiveness rate or its ability to prevent COVID disease. People have questions about, will it work for me? Will it work for my demographic? In these 30 or 40,000 volunteers, the vaccines were tested in men and women from young to old, whites, blacks, um, Asians, Hispanics, Latinos, many different demographics. And again, in all these groups, they've been proven extremely effective and safe. And yes, uh, people had questions about, I read a blog that said that this induces narcolepsy, Guillain-Barre, uh, a whole bunch of questions. The CDC has rolled out, I show here at the bottom, this V-Safe. It's an app you can download to your phone. You should uh, put this on your phone before you get the vaccine. If you have any adverse reactions, you can log on to this and you can immediately register with the CDC any adverse effect. But the data we have is it's less than one out of 100,000 people who are vaccinated. Again, Dr. Duggan talked about risk analysis. Currently in Ohio, 50 out of every 100,000 people are infected with COVID. So you can do the math here. Your risk is 50 out of every 100,000 are infected, or you have a one out of 100,000 chance of having some adverse reaction. And again, even in those cases, those are fairly mild. Next slide, please. So we have questions about if I've had COVID, do I need to, or can I get the vaccine? And if so, are there any complications? So in these clinical trials with these volunteers, some of those people actually did get COVID. From all the data we have, there's absolutely no complications. And in fact, as I show in this graph here, where disease symptoms are on the horizontal axis and then immune response is on the vertical axis, we now have data that people who have very severe COVID-19 tend to have the strongest immune responses after they recover. And conversely, the people who are either asymptomatic, who have no disease, or uh, who have very, very mild COVID symptoms, their antibody responses after they recover are minuscule. So in fact, if you've tested positive or if you have mild disease, you should absolutely get the vaccine. And in fact, the CDC strongly recommends that. And again, there've been no complications thus far with five and a half million people vaccinated. Next slide, please. Questions about how long does it take before the vaccine starts working? The data we have from all these clinical trials going back to June, July, August, indicate that it takes approximately two weeks or 14 days before people start to mount immune responses. Now, again, we don't quite understand what those immune responses are needed to fully protect, but we do see antibodies after two weeks. Next slide, please. How long will it take for the vaccine to work and how long will it take for that vaccine to last? So people have questions about, well, I have to get this multiple times per year. The simple answer is we really don't know. The data we do have is that the antibodies that are induced by both vaccines persist in volunteers and people being vaccinated for at least four months. There is some slight decline in those antibodies, but your immune system is very complex. The things that are needed to kill the virus are probably more than just neutralizing antibodies, which you may have heard about, which can bind to the virus and inactivate it. In fact, you have many other immune cells that can do the work. So the simple answer is the immune responses last at least four months. So they could last longer. Your immune status could alter that. However, uh, I just told you that you start to see immune responses at two weeks. You need both vaccine doses to get the full protective 94 to 95% protection. So don't skip that second dose. Make sure you take it at the right time, either, either three or four weeks, depending on which vaccine. Next slide, please. And then we had questions about what if I get infected between vaccine doses? Again, 
This has happened during the clinical trials for both vaccines. There's no complication. The CDC recommends that if you do get infected with COVID between the vaccine doses, you should allow uh, yourself to recover to where you're non-symptomatic anymore, the 10 or 14 days, depending on what you are advised by, by local health authorities. And then after you're fully recovered, you can resume, resume and get the second vaccine dose. And again, there should be no complications. Again, this has already happened with the clinical trials um, and there should be no complications. And I think that's my last slide. With that, I'll turn it over to Dr. Taylor. Hi, all. Uh, nice to see you again. Uh, so we've received some questions about the new virus variants that have been showing up on the news. So my goal here is to give you a brief background on the biology behind the emergence of the new viral variants. Um, we also call them mutants or, or strains, um, and then highlight how they're different from the virus that we came to know in 2020. So viruses like SARS-CoV-2 that causes COVID-19 are based on RNA. Uh, so part of their life strategy is to make variations of their very important protein. This approach allows them to rapidly adapt and evade our immune system. If you look at the top of the cartoon on the left, virus infection starts with the binding of the viral spike protein and between that protein and the cell receptor ACE2. The virus then enters the cell and releases its RNA genome. To produce more virus, many copies of this RNA genome is made. While copying, the process will frequently introduce random mutations. Um, see, the red, see the mutations represented on the cartoon in, in red and yellow? Um, so if you follow the cartoon down to the bottom, these RNA genomes containing the mutations are then packaged into viruses to create this diverse set of variant viruses. So the new viruses will then make mutant proteins using this mutated RNA template during infection. So since this is a random process, many of the virus variants will be weakened and defective. However, some mutations may result in virus with altered properties, um, like the ability to infect new or different cells or hosts, uh, improve spread from person to person, uh, changes in sensitivity to therapies, and also the big concern may cause uh, more severe disease. So like on this cartoon, imagine millions of virus variants made from infected cells. So the variants that are better at infecting and replicating in, in cells will have a selective advantage and will start to show up um, more often when we examine the viruses from infected people. Uh, so Dr. Chattopadhyay will talk about how we identify these variants in the next segment. Next, and you already, don't go again. Um, okay, some, some of these, what are some of these variants? Uh, we're hearing much in the news about the UK and the South African variants. I've depicted them, um, the cartoon on the right. Note how they have the example red and yellow mutations on the surface spike protein. So these particular variants are attracting much attention because uh, we're seeing an increase in transmission with these viruses. They are similar in that the major mutations are in the spike protein, that green protein on the top of the cartoon. Um, however, the mutations are in different spots, so they're different viruses. Um, uh, studies indicate that these mutations may increase the binding of the spike protein with the cell receptor ACE2, so it might make it easier for the virus to infect cells. But there's much to learn. We're just finding these viruses. Um, changes in the spike protein uh, garners much attention because um, this is the, the protein that the virus uses to infect cells. Um, it's also the protein that's produced by our vaccines, um, so it's the target of our neutralizing antibodies that Dr. Huntley just talked about. Um, but please note, this is not surprising that these mutant variant viruses are showing up. This is what they do. They, um, so we always got to be aware and we're, we're always looking for them and preparing. Um, the UK variant has been found in the US already. Um, that's why we've been hearing about it a lot. Um, however, the South African variant, not yet. We probably will eventually see it. For both of these variants, even though transmission is increased, we do not see an increase in disease with these viruses. Um, so that's good news right now. And also good news, uh, vaccines would still be effect pr predicted to work against these variants, as well as the drug, the remdesivir that we have currently approved for uh, treating COVID-19. Uh, so next up, um, Dr. Chad Padai will discuss some of the concerns with the variants and how we look for them. Thank you. Hi, good evening, everybody. Happy New Year to all of you. 
First of all, thank you, Dr. Huntley and Dr. Taylor for introducing the vaccines and the new variants. First of all, it is really very confusing with a lot of different new information that we are gathering with the new vaccines and now with the new variants or whatever we call it, mutants or strains. So we naturally have many questions and we really do not have answers to all of them. So what I'm going to do to briefly update you on the current state of the knowledge on these topics. So the first question is definitely that we all have, are the Pfizer and Moderna vaccines going to be effective against the new COVID-19 variants? So we do not have answer, but the scientists at the Pfizer and the Moderna are testing this right now. There are no results yet. So what are they doing? They are, gen they are collecting the antibodies from the vaccinated individual using these vaccines, and they're testing whether they can neutralize the new variants, that is the UK variant, as well as the South Africa variant. And also please keep in mind that when they develop these vaccines, they have also tested against many different COVID-19 strains. So this is not new. And also I'd like to point out that there is no scientific reason for us to believe, based on the design of the vaccine, to believe that these vaccines won't protect against the new variants, at least the two variants that are available. And even if the current vaccines, the Pfizer and the Moderna vaccines are less effective, if that turns out to be true, they are going to be far better than the COVID-19 causing disease itself. So we strongly recommend that getting vaccination is definitely important. Next slide, please. So the next question then we have, are we going to develop new vaccines against the new virus variants? So if, if required, if needed, then against the UK and the South Africa variant, we can generate specific vaccines. And often the vaccines are improved with time. This is not new. It has happened. We have done this before in the case of poliovirus vaccine. Poliovirus vaccines have been improved over time. Also, we deal with the variants for flu. Flu gets mutated every year, and that's why we get annual vaccinations. So we deal with the newer vaccines or developed vaccines every year. So newer or improved COVID-19 vaccines may be developed based on the requirement. So if we, if we see that these vaccines are not effective against all of the strains, it is possible to develop a vaccine that is effective against multiple Variants. The most important thing is that these mRNA vaccines, they're very, they're relatively easier to modify as opposed to the other vaccines. So even if we have to develop vaccines against specific strains, they are going to be relatively easy to develop. Next slide, please. Next slide. So now the question is, how do we detect this new variant, this virus variant? How do we know which virus variant is really coming? There are multiple ways. And the, one of the traditional ways that the viruses are often collected from the COVID-19 patients, they're isolated, and then they're monitored. There's a method that we call sequencing, that they are monitored for new virus variants. But keep in mind that the current antibody or the antigen or even the PCR testing won't necessarily detect this new variant. So we have to use a different method for that. And to this aspect, I also would like to point out that we are also doing a new tool. We're developing a new tool here at the University of Toledo to monitor sewage or wastewater. This is a topic that has already been introduced by Dr. Duggan, that this virus can also be transmitted by fecal oral route. So therefore, what we are trying to do is to, to collect the wastewater and look for the virus gene fragment. And using this strategy, we are not only looking for the fragment, but also sequencing this to monitor if there are new variants coming. This is a research that is currently in progress in, in my lab here at UT, and we are doing this in collaboration with Ohio Department of Health, as well as other state university labs. So hopefully at some point in the near future, we'll come and tell you whether we have detected any variants in our community and utility. Next slide, please. So finally, I'd like to leave you with these thoughts that it is not possible, like Dr. Taylor mentioned, 
it is not possible for us to avoid the generation of this virus variants. So therefore, continuous monitoring is absolutely important. And one other thing we should keep in mind that the new virus variants could be more contagious, and therefore, we should continue to follow all the ongoing safety precautions, such as wearing masks, distancing, and possibly the vaccination that is currently available. So with this, I would like to turn over to Russell Sumit. Thank you. Good evening, my name is Russell Smith. I'm the Chief Pharmacy Officer for the University of Plato Medical Center today. I've been in charge of the COVID um, distribution, vaccine distribution project here at the University of Plato, and I wanted to provide a little update on that and answer some of y'all's questions. Next slide, please. So there are three phases of the vaccine distribution. We're currently in phase 1A. Um, next slide, please. The phases have been set by the CDC Advisory Committee for Immunization Practices, and they're evaluating the, where the vaccine is being given and how it is being distributed through this three-phase approach. Next slide, please. So as I mentioned, we're in phase 1A, which is for healthcare professionals and residents of long-term care facilities. Um, soon we'll be moving into phase 1B, which is um, going to be vaccinating essential frontline workers um, in Ohio. This is going to be the, uh, the teachers so they can get the schools reopened, um, K through 12, and individuals greater than 65 and individuals with high risk. We'll then move into phase three, um, focusing on other individuals of high risk and other essential workers. Phase two then will be when there's still limited amount of vaccine, but they're distributing it to the general population. And ultimately the phase three will be when the drugs are generally available from any pharmacy or doctor's office. Next slide, please. The reason that the vaccine is being distributed the way it is, is to um, decrease death and decrease hospitalization. So they're targeting the older populations and those high risk populations first, because the, um, the rate of hospitalization is very high and consumes a lot of resources for hospitalization. So during this pandemic, it's very important for us to vaccinate the elderly population first to decrease the um, overburden on the hospitals and allow the hospitals to continue to provide care. And more importantly, um, the higher rate of death from um, COVID with this population. Next slide, please. So the governor of Ohio is released on phase 1A, and that's what we're currently in. And so this is vaccinating healthcare professionals who are working with COVID patients and providing the support for those um, providers um, caring for the COVID patients, as well as healthcare providers who are working with COVID patients that are patients who are in a rule out status for COVID. Also then we are um, vaccinating nursing homes, EMS responders, um, assisted living, et cetera. So these individuals that are at very high risk for obtaining COVID and having very poor outcomes from it. Next slide, please. In the next couple of weeks, we'll be moving into phase 1B. And the two clear goals for this is to save lives. So we're vaccinating that elderly population and to restart the schools. So they're gonna be vaccinating the teachers and the workers within the schools. Uh, so this phase will be coming um, very soon, probably end of January. Next slide, please. High risk defined in Ohio is very specific um, disease states. So it, uh, most of these are genetic disorders. They're early onset, such as um, type one diabetes, um, severe asthma, sickle cell disease. So to be qualified as high risk in Ohio and part of phase 1B, you have to have one of these um, conditions. Next slide, please. How does the vaccine arrive to our area? Next slide. The center of disease control is um, determining how much vaccine goes to each state and they're monitoring the degree of outbreaks and uh, the overall incidence of COVID in the various states and then are sending the vaccine to the state. The state then works with the local health departments and hospitals within that um, within that state 
to determine the allocation to the health department and to the hospitals that are providing the COVID vaccine to the um, healthcare workers and to their patients. Ohio Department of Health, they actually ordered the vaccine for these um, institutions. So a hospital can't go in and decide how much COVID vaccine they want. The Department of Health will place the order from the drug manufacturer and ship that directly to the hospital or directly to the local health departments. Next slide, please. How do I obtain the vaccine? So it's really a moving target. Uh, right now in phase 1A, the, health, the hospitals are providing the care to the vaccine to their workers. The health departments are vaccinating the first responders and the pharmacies such as Walgreens and CVS are vaccinating the nursing homes. The future phases though, this is still um, to be determined but we can talk a little about generalities and how this is going to occur. The health department is going to be the central hub and they're partnering with um, one, with businesses and two, with individuals. So if you go to the Lucas County Health Department site, you'll see that organizations, so businesses, manufacturers, schools can all go there and sign up as an organization to partner with the um, Lucas County Health Department. In addition, they can um, individuals can go to the Lucas County um, Health Department as well. So that would be for the retirees, the unemployed, um, et cetera, that are not going to be vaccinated through their employer. Next slide. So Lucas County released this just yesterday where you can go in and if you're a high risk individual in 1B, so if you're over the age of 65, um, or have one of those high risk conditions, you can go in and pre-register for a vaccination clinic. You know, they will ask you some screening questions. They'll ask you your age, your contact information, whether you have any of those high risk conditions. And then um, they will notify you via email when those clinics are available for you to sign up. In addition, organizations, so if you work at a dentist's office or you work at a um, fast food restaurant, if you own one of those, you can go sign up your organization to um, partner with the Lucas County Health Department to help vaccinate your employees when the um, appropriate phase comes up for them to be vaccinated. Next slide, please. So I want to talk a little about what our process here at UT is, just because uh, I know there's a lot of UT people on the call today, and just to give a general idea to the public of what they may expect from their employer when it um, comes around. So what we did is we created a database of all of our employees, students, and all of the um, tens of thousands of patients that come here to the University of Toledo Medical Center. We coordinate this then by sorting it out by departments, job titles, majors, um, then when it comes down to patients, um, sorting it out by age. And then we send targeted invites to those individuals when the times when it comes time up for their queue. So when we did phase 1A for healthcare providers, the nurses and doctors here at the hospital received an email saying, we're going to have a um, clinic on this day. Um, click on this link if you're interested in having receiving the vaccine. You go through all the screening questions, a registration process, and you have an appointment. We built in so that all the consents and um, all the vaccine information, everything you need to know is in that email and when you make that appointment. Currently, we do um, 25 appointments per 15 minute block. So we run about 100 patients through our clinic per hour. So we can do about 800 patients in that eight hour day. Next slide, please. You show up at the clinic, we um, um, don't want anybody to become ill from the clinic. So we um, do social distancing, spread everybody out, um, make sure that there is separation um, between you and the other um, patrons receiving the vaccine. Um, your vaccine be administered by a healthcare professional. You'll receive information. Um, Dr. Huntley talked about the Be Safe program. Um, you'll receive a handout on that and we encourage you while you're waiting your 15 minutes that you actually sign yourself up for that. And then the app will actually text you every day to ask if you're having any symptoms. After about a week, they ask you, um, did you develop COVID? Have you had 
um, were you diagnosed with it during uh, during that time? So it's really a simple process to use. Then depending on which vaccine you receive, you um, will get a um, have a follow-up appointment 21 to 28 days later. The way that we um, do it here is that you make both appointments at the same time. So you, uh, if you signed up for a vaccine on December 23rd, you're coming back on January 20th. So that we know that you received the Moderna vaccine on a certain day, you're coming back then 28 days later to receive that vaccine, your follow-up vaccine. Next slide, please. I can't stress the importance of using the resources and using good quality resources out there. I encourage everyone on this WebEx to go to the Lucas County Health Department website. You don't need to remember that link. Just Google Lucas County Health Department COVID vaccine. It'll take you to all their information. They have a great frequently asked questions section there. Um, also, Ohio Department of Health, the um, uh, coronavirus site there has great information, um, frequently asked questions that answers many of the questions that um, you all have answered today. And continue to follow your local news and your employer's newsletters for when these clinics are going to occur so that you can get signed up and um, receive the vaccine. I can't stress the importance of everyone going out and receiving this vaccine so we can reach the herd immunity that um, Dr. Duggan was speaking of. Next slide, please. Okay, now I'll um, transition back to um, Dean Cooper, who will finish up our conversation today. Hey, Russ, and all of our other presenters, thanks for an excellent job of providing informative material to the uh, folks who are on today's call. Um, I don't know if people have been following the chat box, but there have been some really, really interesting questions posed and answers provided by our experts. I would like to highlight one or two of those. Um, there was a question about uh, should children be in school and what's the risk of transmission in schools? And uh, Jennifer, do you want to address that? Because I know that's quite topical and there's lots of concerns about uh, kids and COVID. Sure. Uh, you know, so it's interesting. There has actually been a study uh, looking at children in schools uh, that was published in the Morbidity and Mortality Weekly Report uh, by the Centers for Disease Control. And what they found was that kids were actually safer in school. Uh, there was less uh, infection when, when kids were actually attending school in person than they were not when they were staying at home. And the problem was that they were socializing with people outside of their household. So it really comes down to, you know, what I said previously about being around people that you don't live with. Um, so if kids are in school, if they're wearing masks, they're socially distancing and they're washing their hands, it's actually safe for them to be there in person. Thank you very much, Jennifer. You know, another interesting uh, conversation that's going on in the chat box is the recent advent of um, reduced dosing for some of the vaccinations. If you'll notice that uh, 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 Dr. Huntley responded to that and said the FDA came out strongly advising against reduced dosing. I don't know if either Russ Smith or Joan Duggan or any of our other participants want to make a comment about, you know, should, should we be considering or implementing reduced dosing as we're trying to initiate um, all these vaccinations, or is that something we should stay away from for the moment? I, I, I'll, I'll say something brief and I'll turn it over to Russ, but I think, I think you need to leave it alone. So absence of evidence is not evidence of absence. Basically the trials were done in a certain way, and that's what we can say works. And that's basically all we have. We can't tell you if any of these other strategies such as the ones that they're using in the UK will work. We just simply don't have any data. Therefore, we don't recommend going off script in this. Because if you think about it, the consequences are too important. So if it doesn't work, then you've really wasted literally millions of doses of vaccines, giving people suboptimal, subtherapeutic coverage. You know, it's one of the hallmarks in infectious diseases. You have to have the, the right drug in the right way at the right dose. Uh, for the right duration, it's the same thing with vaccines. So you go off script at your own peril. It doesn't. It doesn't mean, therefore, that we a recommendation won't come out later saying some of these vaccines are interchangeable, etc. But right now, that's not the way it is. Right, I absolutely agree with um, Dr. Duggan that there just needs to be more information on that. That there's no science um, 
not enough science for that yet at this point. And when you think back to my one slide of that the individuals greater than 65 or greater than 85, and they're 630 times more likely to die from COVID. And when we need to vaccinate the populations to the way the literature says based on risk. And that's how we can um, help conquer this um, pandemic early. Thank you both for excellent commentary on the, the reduced dosing of the vaccine. Um, so, so look, we're at 6.30, our hour is up. Uh, we've had an excellent conversation with um, really expert people. I'm gonna make a few closing remarks and then we'll let everybody go. First, I'd like to express my appreciation to tonight's speakers who are doing the work to help inform our communities and nation about this crisis. Uh, thank you so much. Um, the information is really evolving quickly, thanks to our scientific community's continue of discoveries and emergency, emerging uh, treatments. Just think when we did this a few short weeks ago, there was no such thing as the UK variant or the South African variant. And so, again, we think that the knowledge on this and the discoveries will continue to gallop forward. To keep you informed, we're planning another COVID town hall in about a month on Thursday, February 4th from 5.30 to 6.30. Um, and I'd like to ask that uh, in after today's discussion, if you could put a response in the chat box or fill out a very short survey and let us know what you need to know because we'll try to do our very best to compile answers and, and provide the needed information. Um, I'd also like to say that I hope you share what you learned tonight with your friends and family and neighbors and uh, folks at your churches or in your community. Just like there needs to be herd immunity through vaccination, we need to get the word out and create a herd immunity of knowledge within our community so our community is well informed and behaving in a manner which protects all people. Um, I, on the last point I would make is that we continue to be at a critical state in dealing with the virus. We know that many of our hospitals, both locally and across our country, are at dangerously high occupancy rates. You know, we hear about hospitals which no longer have sufficient oxygen or beds to take care of people. That's terrifying. I'd also say that the healthcare providers, Russ Smith, Joan Duggan, uh, Jennifer Hanrahan, nurses, x-ray techs, respiratory therapists, physicians, others, pharmacists, our healthcare providers have been on the front lines battling this virus for nearly a year now. Tonight, please follow the guidelines. Uh, be safe when it's available. Get your vaccine so that you can keep yourself safe and your loved ones safe. This also gives honor to our caregivers who are working tirelessly to care for us and our families and our friends, our neighbors and our coworkers. So please stay healthy and safe and we'll see you back in a few weeks. Thank you so much.